Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, my name is Spencer Ruckty. I'm the author events manager here at Third Place Books in Seattle, Washington. Uh, on behalf of Third Place Books, a uh, community bookstore in Brooklyn and the Goethe pop-up in Seattle, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's conversation between Sasha Stanishit with Damien Searles and Jennifer Croft. Uh, today is the US publication day uh, for Where You Come From, translated by Damien and out today from Portland, Oregon's own Tin House Books. Uh, first of all, I wanna invite all of you to use the chat window at the bottom of your screen to say hello. Uh, let us know where you are calling in from today. Uh, and I just wanna say that one of the few silver linings of the pandemic is that bookstores across the country are now better positioned to support international literature and bring authors like Sasha to our event series in partnership with bookstores like Community Bookstore. I am unbelievably excited to have Noah Mintz, who is the author uh, events coordinator at Community Bookstore in Brooklyn, here with us this afternoon. Uh, Community Bookstore has a stellar event series that I encourage you to check out at communitybookstore.net. Uh, event season is winding down for bookstores across the country as we plunge neck deep into the holiday season, but I do encourage you to sign up for our email newsletters, which I will post links to in the chat below, uh, and you will be notified about our upcoming virtual author event series. Uh, so thank you again for tuning in and for supporting independent bookstores. Uh, second of all, I want to thank our friends at the Goethe Pop-Up in Seattle for their support of today's discussion. Uh, our local Goethe Institute has been instrumental in supporting German literature in Seattle, and you will find few institutions as eager to support cultural opportunities like this one. So you can find out more about their cultural programming at your local Goethe Institute uh, at their website, goethe.de forward slash en. As I mentioned before, the chat window at the bottom of your screen is open and we encourage you to use it respectfully. Uh, today, we'll also have some time for your questions. So, uh, which, uh, so if you have questions for our authors this evening, you can please submit those to the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen, which is separate from the chat window. Uh, we also offer closed captioning for those uh, who are interested, just hit the live transcript button at the bottom of your window to turn this feature on or off. Uh, you will also see me posting in the chat window uh, links to where you can buy, where you come from tonight's featured book. And without further ado, uh, I am going to pass the screen on to Noah, who will be introducing our speakers today. Uh, Noah Mintz, take it away. Thank you so much, Spencer. It really is a pleasure to be joining you for this very special event. Um, Community Bookstore is currently Oh, Noah, celebrating... I think your audio is turned off. Can you hear me? Uh-oh. <laughs> Um, I can oh, hear you, Noah. Your audio is on. Okay, yeah. great. Um, well, like I said, I was saying um, Community Bookstore is currently celebrating 50 years in business, and we credit the support of readers, writers, translators, and other booksellers for this milestone. So thank you all for spending this afternoon with us. Without further ado, then, I would have the honor of introducing our three stellar guests today. Sasha Stanisic was born in Visegrad in the former Yugoslavia in 1978 and has lived in Germany since 1992. His debut novel, How the Soldier Repairs the Gramophone, was translated into 31 languages. Before the Feast was a bestseller and won the renowned Leipzig Book Fair Prize. His current novel, Where You Come From, published today by Tin House Press, won the German Book Prize. And it really is a fabulous book in an excellent translation. Which brings me to Damien Searles, who is an award-winning translator of many classic modern writers from German, Norwegian, French, and Dutch. He is also the author of The Inkblots, A History of the Rorschach Test, and biography of its creator, which has been translated into 10 languages and a forthcoming book called The Philosophy of Translation. Jennifer Croft was the 2020 William Sarion International Prize for Writing, sorry, she won the, that prize for her illustrated memoir, Homesick, and the 2018 Man Booker International Prize for her translation from Polish of Nobel laureate Olga Tokarczuk's Flights. Sasha, Damien, Jenny, thank you so much for being here and I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Spencer and Noah, for those beautiful opening remarks. And I just want to start by saying how happy I am to be doing this event with Damien and Sasha. I absolutely loved this book, and I'm um, excited to learn, I believe it was Damien who informed me only five minutes ago, that you got a rave review from the New York Times today on Publication Day, which specifically mentions the fine quality of Damien's translation, which is a wonderful thing for a review to talk about. Um, I wanted to start by asking Sasha to read a short passage uh, in German in the original, 
Um, and then we'll have Damien read a different passage in English. Good evening, everyone. Um, guten Abend. Ich habe gesehen, dass einige aus Deutschland hier sind. Um, das freut mich sehr. I will read a short passage um, chapter from the first part of the book. It's called Nähe am Nordpol, closer to the North Pole. And I chose this one because um, it shows in a very, very short scene, like in a theatrical scene, uh, how the tensions between the ethnicities uh, came to our schools, to the kind of an innocent um, ground where the, the question who you are um, was not really a question until uh, the beginning of the 90s. And um, this is what happened then. Näher am Nordpol. Soki kommt ins Klassenzimmer, legt ein Papier auf das Lehrerpult und ruft, alle mal herkommen, jeder trägt sich ein. Es gibt drei Spalten, Moslem, Serbe, Kroate. Alle versammeln sich, alle zögern. Mann, Leute, ey, muss man hier alles alleine machen? Soki nimmt einen Stift und trägt seinen Namen unter Serbe ein. Kenner nimmt Soki den Stift weg und trägt seinen Namen unter Moslem ein. Die beiden Gorans tragen sich unter Serbe ein, Edin trägt sich unter Moslem ein, Allen trägt sich unter Moslem ein, Malica trägt sich unter Serbe ein, Goza trägt sich unter Serbe ein, Kuhle fragt, was der Scheiß soll. Soki sagt ja, damit wir Bescheid wissen. Kuhle sagt, fick dich. Soki sagt, du bist doch Moslem, oder? Ich bin, fick dich, sagt Kuhle. Elvira macht eine neue Rubrik auf mit weiß ich gar nicht und trägt sich da ein. Allen nimmt wieder den Stift von ihr und streicht seinen Namen durch und trägt seinen jetzt nun auch unter weiß ich gar nicht. Goza auch. Marco trägt seinen Namen unter Serbe ein. Anna trägt sich unter weiß ich nicht ein, denkt kurz nach, streicht den Namen durch, schreibt Jugoslawe als fünfte Rubrik und trägt sich da ein. Soki schreibt unter Moslem Kuhle rein. Kuhle sagt, Soki, ich fick deine Mutter, du dummes Pferd. Die Gorans bauen sich sofort auf. Der mit den langen Schneidezähnen sagt, Kuhle, was ist denn los? Wo drückt der Schuh? Kuhle reißt den Soki den Stift aus der Hand. Der will etwas auf Gorans Stirn kritzeln. Der schubst den Kuhle, schubst zurück. Wir gehen dazwischen. Alle rufen durcheinander. Kuhle hebt die Arme. Alles okay, hab mich im Griff. Er tritt an den Tisch und schreibt eine sechste Rubrik auf. Die heißt, fickt euch alle. Da trägt Kuhle Kuhle rein, tritt auf den Stift, der Stift bricht, Kuhle verlässt das Klassenzimmer. Niemand ist ihm gefolgt, die Liste verschwand. Moslems wurde ein paar Monate später in manchen Städten befohlen, ein weißes Band am Ärmel zu tragen. Eine Eskimo-Familie lebte zu der Zeit in Wischegat über dem Supermarkt in der Tito-Straße. Die hatten mit den Inuit nichts gemein, gar nichts gemein. Es war nur ein Witz gewesen bei der Volkszählung 1991. Ein Witz, der aber in die Statistik aufgenommen worden war und bald stadtbekannt war, dass bei uns in Wischegat eine Eskimo-Familie lebt. Der Vater wiederholte den Scherz später während der serbischen Besatzung. Da lachte aber niemand mehr. Also verließ er mit seiner Frau und der kleinen Tochter die Stadt. Sie leben heute näher am Nordpol und sprechen ganz ordentlich Schwedisch. Vielen Dank. Um, hi everyone, thank you all. Thank you Jenny and Noah and Spencer and of course Sasha for writing the book and joining us from distant Zoom land. Um, I never like to read the same passage as Sasha because he's too good and dramatic and I don't want to be like forced to, you know, you'd think as a translator I wouldn't mind, but I don't want to be forced to try and like copy the mannerisms and stuff. But um, that's one of my favorite chapters and it would be a good, so Sasha, I'm going to give you a choose your own adventure. There are three choices. There's okay, like... Okay a uh, sweet high school story, there's Grandma and the Dragons, or there's me reading the same chapter you just read? The sweet high school story. The sweet high school story, okay. <laughs> Because it was my second choice tonight, so. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, uh, I mean, we'll talk about the book as a whole 
um, later, I'm sure. But um, in this part of the book, young Sasha has been forced to leave Yugoslavia and go to Germany. And Germany, though it has problems, is sort of giving him enough of what he needs. That's sort of what's going on in this part of the book. The chapter uh, is called Photorealist Painting. Special project week in school. I had signed up for art for photorealist painting. And just to make sure there's no misunderstanding, I chose photorealist painting, not because I was interested in photorealism or could paint well, or even liked painting, but because Rika would be there. Rika, 10th grade, class B2, red-haired Rika, green-eyed Rika. Rika I liked to look at so much that I was always looking away. <clears throat> I chose photorealism because I wanted to impress her. I didn't know how yet, or if not impress her, then at least by spending five days in the same room as her, inform her of my existence. Up until that point, all my efforts to strike up a conversation with her had failed, probably because they hadn't happened, except in my head. In there, I'd had hundreds of very nice conversations with her about the treatment of animals and industrial farms, about Nirvana, about India, all things that Rika was interested in, maybe. On the first day of project week, I walked into the art room, nervous but firm in my decision. We were supposed to pick a photograph and then paint our picture so that it looked like the photograph or even more realistic than the photograph. Hyper-realistic, the teacher said. And maybe it wasn't clear to everyone in the room, but it was immediately clear to me that this goal was completely unrealistic. I chose a picture of a bicycle leaning against a wall. It seemed like the easiest motif, more or less flat, the fewest colors, the bike was black, the wall orange. Only then did I notice that Rika wasn't there. Maybe she's late, I thought, but she never showed up. Not the next day either. So I had to get through the week without her. Now I had to talk to Andreas about the German army because that was the only topic that Andreas was interested in. Andreas wanted to join the force. He wanted to become a general or at least conduct a war at some point. He actually painted worse than I did, something I hadn't thought possible. And he complained too, saying, painting was stupid. Painting, he said, was, quote, for pussies. I asked him why he was doing it then. Because in the force, he would also face situations he hated that he would have to endure, he said. Situations that would ask too much of him would wear him down. He painted a fruit tree that didn't look like a fruit tree. The thing in the picture looked like a Golf GTI. I painted a bicycle leaning against the wall of a building and the only hyper-realistic part of the painting was the bell on the handlebars. The teacher painted that to show me how to do it. The work was frustrating. I was the only foreigner in the room. Back then I thought maybe foreigners in general don't like painting. Today I know it was a coincidence. On the first day, the handlebars ended up too crooked. On the second day, I got stuck on the spokes, but I kept added next to Andreas, who was enthusing about fighter planes in his deep voice. On the third day, things started going better. I was more relaxed somehow. I'd been painting for three days. The bicycle didn't look that bad at all, if you looked at it from the other end of the room and squinted. I was also happy for Andreas, his having such a clear dream. And I was happy that he tried a bit in the home stretch. His picture still looked extremely crappy, but he was hunkered down in front of the canvas. The tip of his little tongue peeked obliviously out from between his lips. People look so good when they're concentrating. And on Friday afternoon, we were done. We hung the pictures up in the cafeteria where they would stay for a whole month. Mine up on the wall of our Zoom screen between the others, like it belonged there. An old bicycle with a photorealistic bell leaning against a wall in, I would guess, Portugal. Weeks later, Rika and I found ourselves by chance at the same party in the vineyards. I had started eight conversations with her in my head when suddenly she was standing in front of me starting a conversation. Probably no one will believe me, but I'll tell the story anyway. 
Hi, you painted that bicycle, didn't you? Yes, I said very loud because I was so shocked. Cool picture, Rika said, and please note, smiled. The bell is great. Yes, I screamed again. I, I like that you didn't do the whole thing photorealistically. Just the bell, the heart of the picture. Yes! Too bad I was sick. I couldn't come. My name's Rika, Rika then said. I know, I said. My name's Sasha. And Rika said, with a tiara on the S, I know. Rika actually was interested in animals living conditions under industrial farming. She liked Nirvana so-so, and she thought tourism in India was just a subtle way of exploiting the subcontinent. When it was time to tell her something about myself, again, all I could think of was the dumb war, and I didn't want to talk about that. Then, out of nowhere, Andreas popped into my mind. I told Rika I liked fighter planes, thought paratroopers were cool, and admired the high quality of German weapons. And Rika said to all that, ah, interesting. Is that so? I painted a picture with zero talent and not the slightest passion for the fine arts, but with a little time and peace and quiet and materials put at my disposal, together with Andreas, without Rika. The second time we met, I admitted that the military stuff was all a lie. And Rika said, good, as long as you like painting, it's all good. Thank you so much. Maybe a pretty good reading, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Actually, I showed the pic. The, the, did you see it, Damien? Yeah, yeah, no, I did. That's why I meant Zoom didn't come up in your book. I, I threw that in there as a little improv moment. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, no, that I was don't a good that picture. Is. That's better than I thought. That was yours? That, that, that's the picture that I painted. That's right good. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. I mean, uh, what I, actually, this is a great thing because um, how fiction and fact work on this picture. You can show so many things. For example, there is no bell. And in the in the text, I put an emphasis on the bell as a detail, uh, which is over hyper realistic. But the the truth is there, that this bicycle did not have a bell. The only thing was kind of a shadow, maybe that was kind of nice. Did but your this is the teacher whole book do any of it? Hmm? Did your teacher what? do any of it, or what, did you do the whole thing? No, he helped me with the shadows. So oh, with um, the shadows. That, that part is true. Yeah, but, the shadows were good. Yeah. They were good, yeah. And <laughs> and this is how the whole. I mean, often I get asked about you know the the kind of the connection between fiction and fact and memory and you know remembering and forgetting so this picture is basically great because there that's how i work i if i have an idea that it won't change the, the perspective on the subject in this case is a guy from a, being a refugee coming kind of to to an, to okay normal life as a teenager you know getting to know a girl in this case and then falling in love so other things got got important for me that means i kind of overcome overcame a couple of those precarious situations in my life and could focus on on things that young people should focus on so and this is the, the bell you know the, i i chose little things um, to change and how 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 you know that doesn't hurt anybody but it's it's good for the story so i would you know prefer preferably to find a little detail to in my mind to improve the story it doesn't have to be true and uh, this is kind of a fair game to the to player but there is this image i painted it really i did to go to this place to meet her so th this whole background story is is true and andreas the guy in the text he's true too and i googled him and i found he ended up in the military how beautiful this was his whole life was talking about you know military stuff and then i was like oh what, what does he do today so i googled him and he's like he has he's like high rank officing maybe if you if you're watching this i like you <laughs> so, <laughs> so there is a, there is a continuation to this um yeah sorry i'm just um i like this chapter a lot oh i mean that's super interesting and it's a good place to start with with the relationship between truth and fiction and i'm wondering if um if you know you consider something like the bell to be the hyper realism something that's almost more real than what really happened because it is so concise and so powerful and it's so able to kind of gesture towards something deeper. <clears throat> yes, um, um, sometimes there were um, memories fading in a sense that I would not be able to recreate um, 
a complete setting of a scene or I would not know the words that have been told, which is completely normal because some of the events I'm describing are so far away. But I would know um, kind of the emotional um, background and I would know that there, there, when, if I was not alone at this moment, that there is somebody who I could ask to help me, you know, form this emotional background into a story. And that's also kind of a hyper-realism towards feelings, towards um, having, um, um, for example, how we lived in Germany. Um, I could not really remember the first days when we arrived. So I would, I, but I had a very, very concrete feeling of um, not being scared anymore. So in order to tell this feeling, how after the, the long um, trip across Europe with my mother, um, I, I did not need the, 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 the events that happened in Heidelberg when we arrived in order to tell my, my loss of fear. But that was a story I wanted to tell. I wanted to tell no matter how foreign this place was, there was something very important missing now. I was not afraid anymore. So I, I chose a completely different track with my mom to the city, buying ice cream, doing stuff we did not do, but it did not matter. It, what mattered is to come to the conclusion in this, in this text how my emotional um, yeah, setting was back then, knowing that this is something that many refugees deal with, refugees deal with when they arrive somewhere at the place. The first days are unbelievably important and they set a lot of psychological um, agenda for the next months and years. So, and I, I, I was looking for you know, stories to tell in order to tell the story of me not being afraid anymore. So there is also this hyper-realism not in, in pictures and images and words, but hyperrealism, meaning I want exact this feeling and I will choose a story to tell this feeling. So there is that also. You know, that's a really interesting answer from my perspective as a translator, because people often make the analogy, um, a translator translates a text and a writer translates their experience. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that's a bad analogy usually because um, whether or not there's a text there is an essential difference. And what a writer's doing isn't translating something that's there. It, yeah. it, it just breaks down. Except the way you described it made it sound like a better analogy than I've tended to think in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, the way you described it, um, that there's a very, in a way, fixed, or at least you've solidly understood this emotional reality. Yeah. And then if that's your given, then what you're doing after that does start to sound like a reasonable analogy with translating, that you're just sort of picking whatever means you have at your disposal exactly. to generate the same feeling. I mean, that's what I feel myself doing as a translator when the feeling has already been produced in me as a reader by the text that I read in the original language. So the way you described it makes writing sound closer to translating than I've usually kind of accepted. It is in this particular case, I, I, I also think you just said something very important. You need as a translator, as a reader, you need to understand the feeling too, not only the words, because you know what makes you then your like literal translator. But I think, I, I do think that uh, some parts of the, of the book are, also my attempt to recreate the reality as, as close as I could, uh, knowing that I have um, the story already there. I don't need to invent. It's, it's so in this inner archive of, of my biography. So I just need to dig really thoroughly. So that's when, when you are also asked to, as a translator, to dig into your uh, archive, your experiences, and maybe find something that you could connect to with, uh, with, uh, with this story. So there are different ways, but I think in this Heidelberg chapter, which I was mentioning, uh, that, that's, you know, you, you have to work what I give you there, and there's a lot of this, you know, emotion and, and, and um, anxiety, and also the descriptions of how you lose something that you actually, I'm not describing the fear, but I'm losing it. So you have to deal with that too. Um, it's actually a nice chapter to talk maybe tomorrow about too, so. I mean, I, I would like to ask a follow-up question about the process of recreating a story and also connected to translation. So um, I wonder kind of what it means for you to recreate the story in a language other than the one in which it originally happened, because a lot of the things in your childhood, of course, are not taking place in German, but you are recreating that story in German. And I wonder how that feels for you. 
Um, I, 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 the the rank, ranking is always the same. I, I have um, kind of a goal for, for a chapter or for a scene or for a, for a character. And I need, need this to fulfill. I need this task to, to succeed. And it does not always <laughs> succeed as you probably as a writer know yourself. But um, to reach this, um, the second step is to create a story for, for this particular scenery or whatever I want to tell now. Uh, and this case, I'm always choosing my better language and it's always German. So it's always the, the same choice. I'm not, um, even if the memories or uh, the happenings that I'm describing are completely Yugoslavian based in my childhood where there were no word of German, um, I will still choose the thinking language. When I think and I plan the story and I write it, it's always going to be German. So what I do, but in the fourth step is I would um, then, after the story is set and I have my, you know, my, my character and my, my setting, um, I would go back and then try to, if I have dialogue there or a narrator narrating a very um, kind of a close to the figure, for example, if I go down to the perspective of a boy uh, with my narration, then I would check the language to see how I could make it to be closer to the original, to the to my first language. So I would really go into the detail and see, for example, try out the sentences, um, if I can change the word order, so to, to imitate um, in Ger German, to imitate, to be more closer to the Serbo-Croatian, to the original. Or I would use um, sayings from, I would translate uh, literally sayings from the Serbo-Croatian into German, sayings which are not in, in the German language in order to make the reading of the text kind of a exotic in a way, which is not exotic, it's just closer to the original again. So I would, I would have this set of, of possible ways to, to languagely close, close by to the, to the original moment uh, where it happened. But to the, the whole uh, way to this moment is in my head, it's happening in German until then. I have this I had I did this also in my first novel where I would um, you know really really try to um, uh, in every single dialogue check if those people are actually talking um, if somebody from Bosnia would read this I wanted him or her to 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 hear in her head or his head oh wait wait, wait a second this is why this sounds so familiar and this is sometimes a really hard task because. You're, this is again a kind of a translation thing, uh, Damien. So I, I translate myself, but I must admit it's not always possible to come as close as you want. It's just the, the languages are really, really not always giving this. And it there is a fear of it becoming too artificial or too um, far-fetched. And you can kind of ah, read it into the text that there is something off, but in a, like, like in a bad way off. And that's not what, what I want to do. I don't want to disturb the flow of reading by, you know, uh, putting whatever I can from the civil creation. So that's the process. And I wondered, so Damien, how do you translate those moments that are two languages in one? Is that more difficult? Yeah. Um, the, I, I'm staring off into space because there are a couple different uh, angles to that question. Um, often the other language is English, because English is such a dominant language in the world. I'm often translating things, including in this book, where a character is learning English or speaking English or visiting America or something. And so the author is, in one way or another, playing with um, an imperfect knowledge of English that's very hard to mirror because, um, you know, like an example from another book is uh, someone refers to to hot dogs like the hot dogs um, carts in Central Park in New York as Heisehunde, which means hot dogs, like dog animals that have a high temperature. And that's a joke that works in German and works for translations from German into basically every other language in the world except not English, because if you translate that as hot dogs, it just reads like hot dogs. And so you have to either try and find some way to talk about overheated puppies or, you know, in some way like talk around it, but it doesn't work because it's not hot dogs. So you just have to 
in in that case, I sort of gave up there, but talked about the hot dog carts as mobile kiosks, which is something no American would ever call them or think about it as. Like that, the kiosks are things that they have in Europe and like mobile kiosks sort of gets that same not quite native sensibility into the translation, but you can't do it with Heise Honda. So, um, so there's that. In terms of uh, translating the kind of moments Sasha was just describing, I guess I see myself kind of as the native German, not at all Serbo-Croatian familiar reader who also reads your books in Germany. In other words, you described like, oh, the Bosnian reader reading in Germany gets a little hint. Well, there are a lot of readers in Germany who don't get that hint at all because they have no familiarity with the language or maybe even culture. And so at the same time, your books are written for them or at least accessible to them. And what do they get out of those moments? Well, I imagine they get a certain energy, but not specifically a Bosnian energy or something. I don't think unless they, they get that from the context. And so yeah. that's what I'm translating. So in, in that sense, I just turn into that variety of monolingual German reader um, because I'm not gonna be able to get, I, I mean, I suppose there's some cases where, you know, I could tran... <laughs> uh, Wallace Stevens has a line, the moon followed the sun like a French translation of a Russian novel. So, I mean, I'm sure there's some moments where you could get the, you know, it's like a spy speaking German with a Russian accent kind of thing yeah. in there. But generally, no, I'm not trying to do that because I'm just trying to get the kind of uh, vitality of the German piece of writing into an energetic piece of English writing. Yeah, exactly. There would, there would also not be a need for, because you notice the sentence still makes sense and should make sense. And it should, uh, in Germany, even it's not, um, it's not really unfamiliar. I, I just found an example of it with Poskok, with the snake where I'm talking, where I'm actually using a Serbo-Croatian word for the snake, for, for I don't know, the, the English word for the, um, for the horn otter. The, um, and I, in this passage, I'm, I'm quoting what my grandmother used to say. And I'm, that's what I just, I would, I just saw that I am using the word order of Serbo-Croatian. But there is no way that, the, that somebody who is not familiar with the Serbo-Croatian language would notice this because this is a completely okay sentence in, in, in German. And Damon just said it, you, you maybe sometimes notice, oh, this is like not the first choice of words that I would use, but okay, right. he's you know, playing with right. something. And for yeah. the translation, I guess it's, it's, it's important to recognize that there is something happening in there, but um, not really, I, there will be an impossible task to track every single reference. To right, the, and then, I mean, really what I'm doing when I'm writing something in English is getting the non-standard English energy onto the page, because that's what the readers of the, English are going to do. So I do get to read a little bit of your Closer to the North Pole chapter, because that's the perfect example of it. Um, what's happening in the chapter for people who don't know German is that a kid has just walked into the classroom with a sheet of paper that has three columns on it, Muslim, Serb, Croat, and says, everyone write your name. And so all the different students who are now being forced to very literally in front of their classmates you know, own up to their national identity, which is going to soon turn out to be a life and death uh, matter, are confronted with this. So, uh, Adin puts his name under Muslim, Alan puts his name under Muslim, Maritza puts her name under Serb, Goza puts her name under Serb, Kule asks what this is all about. Zoki says, so we know. Kule says, fuck you. Zoki says, anyway, you're Muslim. What I am is fuck you, Kule says. And that's an inversion both of the Kule says, which has been at the beginning of all the other sentences, and the what I am is, is sort of inverted within the quotation. But that just seemed like 
that creates this confrontation and this kind of uh, extremely hostile energy that um, Kule is giving off and sort of confronting the other students with who are shooting it at him. So, um, you know, that's a case where the word order of the German, I mean, I forget if the word order flips a little in the German too, if that's how you conveyed it. But in any case, this is how to convey it in English. And as a translator, I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to do more than slavishly follow the um, specific variations that you're putting in. Exactly. And this chapter also has uh, some, some uh, cursing, which I translated literally. So this is one of the examples. So if you would look through the text and you will find, you would, you would not find this cursing in German. Or no, no, I was going to apologize for that too. I'm afraid I've read like the only two curse words in the whole book. So just so you know, it's a very kid-friendly book. Those are okay. the only two curse words, what Andreas thinks painting is for and what Kule says his category is. Um, I apologize for that. <laughs> Well, while, while we're talking about some of the details of the translation, Damien, I was wondering if you could say how you decided what the title in English was going to be. I was hoping you'd ask that. I'm glad you asked that, Jenny. Um, so the title of the book is uh, Herkunft. And if you look in a dictionary, the definition of Herkunft is uh, origins, or in some context, like the provenance of a painting or your ethnic background. Um, and uh, Origins is a really terrible title for a novel in English. Um, but it's also just the wrong title. And several reviewers have start have brought this up. Some of them took in a more critical tone and some in a more neutral tone to say, well, the German title is Herkunft, which means origins or provenance. But, you know, they chose to translate it where you come from. Um, but that dictionary that tells you it means origins doesn't tell you that German uses nouns differently than English does. And so parts of speech are not the same in every language. Um, German uh, is really structured around the nouns. In German, you'd say, uh, there, was, there was something of sadness in it instead of there was something sad about it. In English, you do the adjective. In German, you do the sadness. It's quite normal to say things like, fear rose up within me in German. Whereas in English, what that means is I felt scared because I am a human subject and I feel things. And in German, fear is this abstract thing that moves around within you like one of those house cleaning robots along the floor, but in English, that's not normal. Um, so translating a noun with a noun is not always right. Um, and then specifically about Herkunft, so I mean, one reason this is true is that German nouns have a very dynamic energy to them, often because they're made up of parts. Um, so Herkunft, Her is a preposition, it means um, from where, from somewhere towards you, where you are now. So, for example, woher kommt sie is where does she come from? Wohin geht sie is where is she going to? So, whence and whither we used to have those words in English. Um, Kunft is a is a noun that's sort of an accomplished act of the verb to come or to arrive. So for example, an airplane or a train arrival is an Ankunft, coming to somewhere. The future is the Zukunft, what's coming at you. If you ask someone for information and they tell you it's Auskunft, it's what comes out of that interaction. So Herkunft is where it comes from. Like that is a literal translation. That's a more literal translation than origins. The only part you have to add in English is the pronoun. And since Sasha is alive, I could just ask him. I said, so Sasha, I sent him an email. We could call this book Where I Come From that emphasizes that it's your Sasha's personal story. Or we could call the book Where You Come From 
which kind of ropes in the reader because you is uh, the same as the second person pronoun, but here you is the sort of impersonal third person casual pronoun of like where one comes from, where people come from. And he said, oh, option B, definitely better. And the editor agreed and I agreed. So we were done and didn't have to fight about it. So where you come from, aside from the you, is a literal translation if you're actually looking at how the language works. If you're just saying, oh, Herkunf noun, dictionary says origin, then it raises a question that shouldn't really be there. Well, I really like that explanation, Damien. Thank you very much. I, um, some of the things I did not even know, um, it's really nice for me. I also like the you because of this kind of a, maybe some people will felt as the question would, was, you know, towards them, uh, directed towards them, which I really like because so many um, of nice encounters after the release of the book were from people who came after the readings, for example, or wrote me letters to tell me their story. So they felt encouraged to say where they were from. So that is a kind of a, just a, just a little um, add to this, that it's really, I really like this you, uh, which can also, also mean the readers, uh, where, right. you, where you come from. So that's yeah. really a nice second uh, level to this title. Yeah, I love that. And I, I wanted to stay with that you precisely. And just, we, we kind of, um, galloped off into some details of the book, but we didn't really talk about what form it's in, and it, it does have an unusual form. So it's in these um, these short vignettes. I'm trying to find a good one that I can show on the camera. Um, usually not quite this short, but ranging from those to a few pages. And then at the end, um, I wonder if you could talk about how you decided to have a very unusual kind of twist ending, which is a choose your own adventure, which really gives the reader a lot of agency. Um, I just prepared actually something for these questions because I was hoping it will come. <laughs> I had, um, I had a, I don't know if you can see this right now. Um, no, you see yeah. the, the bicycle still, right? No, no, this is it. We see it. Oh, okay, good, because I see the bicycle. So this was the structure of the last, um, at the end of the book and for the people who did not read the book yet um it's basically all the numbers you can see you can see the numbers right um yes stuff, yeah so all of them are little chapters in the end of the book uh where you as a reader um can take part uh in choosing the way how the next chap what the next chapter will be so you decide basically um how this book will end and there yeah, are and little... so li literally it's it's like the choose your own adventure books from that you may be familiar with uh, exactly. from being a kid. It's called Dragon's Horde, mm -hmm. in very like medievally cheesy font. And it actually says on the bottom of the page, you know, if you decide to take grandma back to the old age home, turn to page 310. And if you decide to ignore the nurse and walk grandma to your car, like turn to page 297. So it literally is the choose your own adventure thing where at the bottom of the page, you sort of decide which page to turn to. Exactly. Those are the books that I really liked as a child and they stayed um, in my memory, as a fond memory when I began reading myself and um, most of them are genres. So most of them are fantastic, lost fantasy with dragons and stuff. And uh, I chose one of the motives from Serbian Bosnian mythology um, <clears throat> where there was a, a small regional belief that dragons are um, kind of a, like a, like they are guarding the entrance to the place where the dead are. And my grandmother who had dementia, she's a very central figure in this book, um, um, had talked a lot about her husband in these last uh, months and, and the year of her life and um, uh, mixing up very many you know biographical details with stories that were completely only in her head and very absurd things and also the dragons came came in her mind often and um i kind of wanted to to you know to I want, we've already talked about this subject too and, and one and one um way to show how many decisions in my life um have been made by other people so for example that we are sitting here me as an author speaking German, now English, writing books, being translated. 
Um, many people along my way helped me and my family in a very, um, very gracious way. Um, and this book is about this, these coincidences that lead us to become somebody because somebody else is going out of his way or her way to help you. Um, this is, of course, in a very short, small uh, directing manner. You don't have many choices. Yeah, it's very limited. You, I give you already hints how this will end. But there is something about being determined that your fate is being determined by somebody else. And this is the, the one reason I chose this end. And the second one is my grandmother uh, died while I was writing the book. And I, I really could not really cope with that because um, one of the main reasons I wrote this it was uh, after I talked to her a lot about her life. And she was a woman who raised me as a child, basically. And I um, did not know much about her, but she was so lost in this void of lost memory that, that there was nothing, not much to find. There is, the, the sickness took it away. So I didn't want, did not want her to die. And then there, there is somebody us writers can do is kind of keep something alive in literature. So I wanted her to stay alive until I could cope with the pain of lo losing her. And this was a way because you as a reader will lead her and me on a one like li really adventure it's an adventure it's a fantastic adventure to dragons too there are fairies and and dance in magical forests and uh and my my i used it also because my grandmother did tell a lot of good stories and a lot of nice ap aphoristic sentences to put some of those of hers into this part of the book so i could you know use it as a, a kind of also an archive to keep her alive as somebody who was really really a great person and a very important person Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, Spencer, I don't know if you were... There you are. Hey. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, just going to pop on and introduce the audience Q&A portion of our event. Um, I will give one last plug. I want to just kind of show the audience this, uh, what we're talking about when we we're talking about this choose your own adventure section that makes up the tail end of the book. We have sort of the final pages of the novel, quote unquote, you know, per se, uh, the end about you know page 294 and then you have this section called dragon sword this is the fun fonts that uh, i think they, uh, jenny or damien is referring to you even have like the classic choose your own adventure warning script at the beginning of the section that says do not read this book in order you decide how the story should continue you create your own adventure uh and i'll, ju I'll just say like like sasha's saying i mean it's it's funny like it's a it's an enjoyable sort of creative presentation of of uh, this work, but also it's it's very heartfelt and very serious. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of deep meaning. You have to read the, you have to kind of find your finagle your way through the end to really get the ending of the book. So, just one last, I just wanted to throw in that one last plug. And um, and, before, and just to yeah. loop back to the discussion before, you know, I didn't quite put a fine point on this, but the difference between Herkunft and origin is that origin is static. It's an X on a map yeah. or it's one checkbox in your list of ethnic identities or whatever. And what Herkunft means is the starting point of the journey that has brought you here. That's what the hair means. It means from somewhere else to where you are now. So the t that's why the title of the book has to have more of this movement in it that I think the choose your own adventure um, kind of instantiates in another way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, let's get to audience questions. Our first question I'm going to pull here is from Susan, who asks, uh, is there a conflict between translating a word correctly or establishing the mood? Oh, let me see. Whoops. Let's see. Oh, there's a, <laughs> there, a great example of the uh, the dragon stand, which we have, is one of the classics. Sorry, I yeah, one of the classics. No, that's okay. Did I have translated a dragon's den? <laughs> Did the translation um, in the English have said dragon's den? I don't know. I think horde. Um, let me check. The German is horta, which is you know horde. Yeah. But you did you did you did, you did well yeah. you did you, you well no that's what I'm asking should yeah. I have said dragons no 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 no, 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 no. this is the different it's just one of the books that had the similar um, kind of a similar uh -huh. setting because there's also at the end of the the, the dragons uh, den is there's also like a huge um, uh, horde like he's there's a right, the treasure yeah. Yeah. and and stuff <laughs> no I mean you have to um, like 
some of the language of the warning you just brought up, Spencer, is taken directly from, like, I went and looked at all yeah. Choose Your Own Adventure books yeah. and just sort of copied it, but you have to decide, was Sasha actually translating it faithfully and so the correct version is the original, or was he modifying it? Um, so, like, there's an earlier chapter called The Strange Dimly Lit Cave of Time, and there's what purports to be a quote that is actually a bit different from the English, uh, from what would have been a literal translation of the English. Yeah. So that means using the actual English would be the wrong translation because right. Sasha did things to it. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that all goes to uh, the question. You I put was the bell in the translation, even right. if it isn't the bell. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, I think this goes, uh, I mean, this answers, I think, Susan's question here, which is, is there a conflict between translating a word correctly or establishing mood or intent of the author, um, which you accept as part of the process? And that that is, based, you know, essentially part of the process. Well, it's I just not, think correctly, not translating word for word. I, think, I think correctly is usually presupposed within a certain, like, vocabulary mm -hmm. exam in school kind of context. And, you know, you might be graded worse if you don't say Herkunft means origins, but yeah. origins isn't correct. Right. Jenny, do you find this, like, do you translate the same way or is this similar to your, you know, philosophy of translating? Yeah, very much so. Especially titles. I mean, you have to really, yeah, obviously make a title pop and it's more like translating a poem in, in that, like, in a, in a work like a novel, you have plenty of room to play around and compensate and add things in if you lose them. But if it's a one word title, you know, you kind of have to um, make it pack as much of an emotional punch as it possibly can. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Marcus here uh, who asked Sasha, if somebody asks you where you come from, uh, what would you say? <laughs> Give him the book. <laughs> buy the book Tell him to out. buy the book. <laughs> oh, it's it's. Um, I'm very pragmatic about it. I'm I'm. That happens a lot of time because my name is still very unusual because it has the tiar tiaras on the on the mm -hmm. s's and c in the end. So um, most of the times people would ask me that when I you know when they don't know me and then they see the name. So. Um, and then I, I would just say my, this really, this is really banal. I was born in Yugoslavia, but I live in Germany for many years. It's, it kind of spares you so much explanation have to doing. So um, I'm just, I'm keeping to the basics <laughs> back then. Um, and this, this book has been um, something that I really earnestly wanted to ask myself in many times, like where, you know, so there is social background, there's financial background, there's this beginning of a new life in Germany. And all of this was like, Exploration, explorations in my life, knowing that many people share this life in a different individual um, circumstances. But uh, the, the, the true answer to the question is, of, of course, for all of us, I don't know how like 60 people were here before, we would, all of us would give completely different answers and dig even deeper than that it gets completely out of, of proportion. So here in my house, we live in like six different backgrounds, people from Slovakia and from, yeah. uh, from Montenegro and says, it's crazy how much political importance this stupid question has. The question is great, but um, it, it, it's, you know, instrumentalized in so many ways politically and um, reduces us to something completely coincidental. Um, so I keep it to the basics. <laughs> I also did paste in the chat uh, the passage that directly answers that in a more um, poetic or a deeper way. So Marcus, if you'd like to look at that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We have a question from Johannes who says, uh, Sasha, what I'm always struck by is how multi-layered your descriptions are. Expanding on what you mentioned earlier about hyper-realism, about the hyper-realism of trying to capture the essence of, for example, a feeling, how much are you aware of this while writing or revising? Or is it some, rather something you rediscover when looking at the text later? And Damien, is this something that has affected your translations? Um, I, I, the, the work process is basically layer, layers of um, trying to get it right or to get it um, as close as I can to what I want to say. It's, I don't know, it's like a, this banal truth for a writer. So I would, what I would do is there is this first draft, which is basically just tell the story, you know, no 
certain um, you know trying to do anything with the language or with the characters, just tell a story. And then then I would like go with like a like a painter, you know, and then the, put a second one which would be closer, and I would try to find a tone um, which should be as hyper realistic as I wanted because this is the story that I want to tell. So this is only true for this book. For um, um, Johannes knows my uh, all of my books because I know Johannes. Um, but for example, for Foreign Fest is a book um, which um, did not need this kind of um, 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 being close to real events or being close to somebody's real life or being this non-fictional uh, kind of a non-fictional play with your life. So what I did is is, is basically there. I would not need this. If I found there is a good story somewhere, I would just go for it. I would not need to recreate this in my mind and on the paper. I would just really go for the story. And I would also not need to always ask myself if this is, you know, how how objectively uh, your your father would see this too. Subjectively, your father would see this or, or my, your mother. There, I was kind of alone as a writer. In, in Herkunft, in where you come from, um, I always have this the feeling that um, I need to get it right because I'm not the only... Uh, um, not only one who who witnesses the witnessed this yeah. thing. I wanted it to 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 because there were so many eyes on this on on my life and on, on many of these things. I was not alone there, and I will give you examples for this. Um, um, I, the, the importance of research doing this. There is one very um, small character in the book. His name is Rahim. And he's a very very good friend of mine. Was back then in Heidelberg. One of my first German friends who basically showed me I don't need to kind of hide or I don't need to live in a parallel world. I can go out. I'm, there are people interested in me who I'm interested in and without any refugee context. So when I, I wanted him to, um, to, to also think of this text uh, as his text, I wanted him, his perspective, to, to know what he thinks about me writing about him, me about writing our, our mutual time in Heidelberg. So in order to, to create the hyper-realism, I needed his voice. I needed his, you know, he was like, I don't know, like when you marry somebody back in the day, so you have an approval of the father or something. So he was the <laughs> one, I needed his approval. In Texas, <laughs> um, so I would, what I would do is, um, is I would just send him this text and I would ask him, please um, tell me, is this, is this close to, to what happened? Is this, is this, is this real life? And um, so the first thing he did, he did, he did is, uh, he was not called Rahim back then. He was, he had a different, he asked me, why did you change my name? This is our story. Why did you change my name? I want to be called, I want my name in here. This is our story. And yeah. then he would tell me all the things. So he contributed to it. Um, he told me details that I was not aware of. And I was like, this is it. This is what, what was missing. I, we are together now creating this story to become more our story. We are making it hyper-realistic. We are going to this, to this very important layer of me not being able to see every angle of the story. So he told me about his parents and how they saw me, which was a perspective I did not have because I, I would have had to invent their perspective because you know I would have to kind of steal it. And this is how I work in, 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 worked in, in Hakon. This was, uh, in many cases, there were, my parents were the, those people, in many cases it was myself trying to you know, paint it the way, the, in the colors that I wanted. Um, and in many cases, it was research and trying to, to get by the people who were kind of witnesses back then. I hope that was the answer for that. Yeah, no, that was a that was a great <laughs> answer. Um, we have time for one more question uh, here before we close out the afternoon. Uh, Lee asks, Sasha, when you write a chapter, how do you deal with memory biases, like judging the past more positively than it actually was, or uh, that the story changes more often uh, as you tell it? Um, this is this is something that um, I it happens a lot because uh, writing about something especially as um, fonts to being uh, a, a, a thing of nostalgia, like your beautiful childhood that got shattered by war, a war uh, you, you notice yourself, you tend to over idolize it, to, um, to make it for yourself. And I think for the keeping it beautiful, making it more beautiful in the story. So this is a really true, um, I would say a true, danger for many of the authors who I um, who I talk to and, and my, my own writing is like that to um, sweeten 
sweeten the memories and to sweeten it not only for yourself but also for the readers which makes again this process of trying to create or recreate some kind of uh, reality really hard because uh, if there is one thing that a writer that it's a very easy task for a writer is to you know recreate nostalgia and make this nostalgia being felt for the reader the same is you know creating a work of literature about the war from a perspective of a child which i did and you know nobody would you know would say uh, we all love children and dogs and little things so we, we would always be on the side of the dog on the child in the war it's like it's such an easy task to 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 kind of man manipulate the reader because that's what it is a manipulate the reader and the more i sweeten it the more i will press into his feeling with my loss when i come to germany when i am a refugee so there is basically a, um a strategy of mine i would um it's very tactical actually i would write again write a, a first draft and i would write a chapter and then if i would honestly think oh this is some there is something there is too much sugar in this I would take like a director, two um, um, uh, characters out of this chapter, or I would create a character, especially for the chapter, and, and write like a theater di dialogue on the stage, two figures, two characters talking about what they just read, like they read my piece. And I, they, I have hundreds of pages, literally, of characters that I created that talk about my shitty writing. <laughs> So, and if they are, I, I let them lose completely. I let them completely go like go crazy on my stuff. And if they are critical about it, then I see, okay, I'm 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 doing it again. I'm sweetening the things. So I would go back and rewrite that, it. Again. That's and it's amazing. Really, it, it has that is why it is endlessly. Sasha, you have to send me some of these. I, that, I will nope. definitely. Every time I tell this story, somebody says, I send it, and then I do it. I will do it. There's no problem. This is not something they teach in American uh, creative writing courses, uh, at least great. as far it as I'm aware of. also to come to new ideas. Not only you solve yeah. the, the, the problems of, of too much positivity or too much uh, you know, um, sweetness, you also solve some dialogue problems or you get a new idea. It's a really um, good thing to, um, to work on your stuff uh, after you have a certain amount of text. It's role-playing therapy. I mean, they do it in other, I'm sure they do it in theater <laughs> contexts too, but. Uh, Noah says in the chat, can we get an edition of all of these compiled? Uh, I think we'd all love to see them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, is all the time we have uh, for this afternoon. Um, I want to thank uh, Sasha, Jenny, and Damien, um, and Noah at Community Bookstore. This has been such a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm really glad that we could help usher this book into the world. Uh, again, uh, I've included several links in the chat where you can find where you come from. You can find that at your local independent bookstores. Uh, we all have them. We're all uh, ready to pass them on to you. Um, and uh, yeah, again, thank you, all, all four of you. Thank you so much for hosting us. Jenny, thank you, Damien, Spencer. Thank you all, really, Noah. Uh, great. Yes, thank you, Sasha. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, and, <laughs> and I will stay, yeah. I will say, uh, put in one last plug. Uh, the Goethe Pop-Up Seattle is actually, their book club book for February is going to be Where You Come From. Uh, so folks will be reading this uh, both in English and in the original German. So if you are interested in that, um, you can always reach out to me uh, or you can click on the link that Goethe Seattle just posted in the chat there. All right, folks, have a wonderful afternoon and Thanks, uh, please Jenny. be well. Thanks, Spencer and Noah. Thank you. Goodbye, guys.